Scary Mysteries, Twisted News, Kevin Gary, and Paul Kenneth Keller. Terrifying cases of true crime and strange events. Every week, Twisted News dives into two mysterious and scary cases currently happening in our world. For this week, we'll look into the latest developments on the controversial stalking case of Kevin Gary and the blistering exploits of the infamous arsonist Paul Kenneth Keller. Get ready for Scary Mysteries, Twisted News. Number 1. Kevin Gary Weird is probably the best word to describe the plight of a man named Kevin Gary. It all began when he met Harvette Williams at a networking event back on April 27, 2003. Williams, a Detroit native, had been working as a hairdresser for a long time and at the event, the two exchanged their contact information. The very next day, he contacted Williams, telling her how much he liked her and wanted to get to know her more, but the mother of two politely declined his advances. Gary didn't take too well to the rejection, though. He then started to drive around her home and places he'd expect her to be. He also called her on the phone more than a dozen times each and every day. Williams was forced to contact police and search for help, but was only told to be careful. At that time, it was hard to arrest, let alone implicate anyone of stalking unless they're caught in the act. Gary exploited the lack of interest from authorities, so aside from the constant calls and drive-bys, he then did something much worse. He approached the maintenance man working at Williams' apartment complex and offered them a sizable amount of money for one little favor, the key to the woman's place. Soon enough, Williams began to notice things happening in her home. Cupboards being opened when she was sure they were closed, the heater running, and the lights being turned on. It didn't take long for Williams to realize that indeed someone was accessing her place. One night, as she was brushing her teeth, something in the corner of her eye caught her attention. It was what appeared to be a human lick mark left on the bathroom mirror. Williams was terrified and over the next several months the harassment continued, resulting in her losing a considerable amount of weight and ultimately being forced to move to another place. She began skipping work out of fear that she might again bump into Gary. In between these times, she was able to file a PPO, or a personal protective order, against her stalker. At one time, she even hired private bodyguards to be with her and her daughters around the clock. And while these countermeasures were able to provide her some momentary relief, the stalking never really stopped. Then one day, she was able to record a conversation they had. Thinking that this could be proof of Gary's violation of the PPO, and it worked. He was arrested on charges of aggravated stalking in 2005 and was sentenced by a court in Michigan to five years in prison in 2006. He got out in June of 2010, and a year later, Gary actually took Williams to court to sue his victim along with other parties, including Oakland County and the city of Southfield, for defamation of his character. Around that time, E! Entertainment released a documentary series called Too Close to Home, which was based on Williams' case. In his claim, he said that the investigative report that the network did on the case inadvertently damaged his reputation as an individual. According to him, this was done despite the fact that he had pleaded no contest to the stalking and was only locked up for violating his probation. In an interview, he likened himself to the character of Kunta Kinte in the movie Roots by Alex Haley. According to him, he was just like the character in the sense that he was forced to take a plea deal. As it happened, the judge in an Oakland County court from which the $10 million worth claim was filed decided to dump the case for reasons not yet disclosed. On the flip side, Williams's harrowing case of stalking prompted Michigan State to legislate a law requiring all stalking parolees to be fitted with GPS tracking devices. 
This is to ensure that authorities would be able to know if these violators had once again breached their terms of parole. Number 2. Paul Keller Relatively speaking, arson, or the criminal act of deliberately setting fire to property, is an easy crime to commit as no particular weapon is needed to do it and it can be done without any interpersonal interaction. Almost a hundred arson cases are reportedly committed in the U.S. annually and this amounts to billions of dollars in losses. Paul Keller alone was responsible for millions of dollars in residential and commercial property damages. More importantly though, he was responsible for the loss of several people's lives. And his fires are considered one of the most extensive arson sprees in all of American history. Keller was born on January 6, 1966, and as a kid always had a fascination with fire. When he was 8 years old, he reportedly set fire to a neighboring vacant house in his hometown of Everett, Washington. His relatives also admitted having caught him setting fire on many different occasions despite the fact that his dad, George, ensured them he would stop after sending him to lectures and seminars about the dangers of fire. His story was later featured on an episode of the TLC original series Forensic Files whereby it was revealed that he was molested by a volunteer firefighter when he was just 12. He was also on several medications through his childhood for hyperactivity, and he has undergone professional counseling. Paul's mental state, though, went into a downward spiral following his divorce and bankruptcy in 1990. In the following years, he began drinking heavily and doing drugs, in August of 1992, out of anger and frustration, the pyromaniac began his six-month-long arson spree in Seattle and its nearby towns. His usual targets were retirement homes, houses, and business establishments. Religious institutions weren't spared either as he set fire to the church that he and his family attended. The man would later on insist that what he did was nothing serious and that the only damages made were to property. However, three unfortunate individuals had fallen victim to his actions. On September 22, 1992, Keller set fire to the Four Freedoms House of Seattle. Three senior residents there perished because of the blaze. They were 93-year-old Bertha Nelson, 77-year-old Mary Doris, and 72-year-old Adeline Stockness. Up until early 1993, firefighters from across the four counties in Washington were called in almost every single night to deal with the fires that the so-called Spectre had been starting. Spectre was the code name that authorities assigned to him when his identity was yet to be uncovered. Neighborhood watch groups were also established. Still, despite everyone's best efforts, law enforcement couldn't pin down the identity of the ruthless Seattle arsonist. Aside from a single fingerprint found on a window screen and traces of footprints on the ground, there's nothing much that could lead them to capture the perpetrator. On January 27, 1993, a cartographic sketch of the perpetrator was released to the public together with the suspect's behavioral profile. The elder Keller almost knew immediately that it was his son and he told authorities. Tracking down Keller's gas receipts and matching them to known fire locations, on February 6, 1993, the Seattle Arson Task Force and police arrested Paul. He initially admitted to setting 76 fires around the Seattle area, though authorities believed he was responsible for a total of at least 100 incidents. In March, he pleaded guilty to 32 counts of arson and sentenced to 75 years in prison for it. Later that year, Keller admitted responsibility for the fire breakout at the Four Freedoms Retirement Home, and so he pleaded guilty to three first-degree murder charges. In March of 94, Paul Keller was yet again sentenced to another 99 years, which he will serve concurrently with his first 75. Keller, who is now 54 years old, is currently serving out his term at the Monroe Correctional Complex in Monroe, Washington. 
Meanwhile, George Keller received a $25,000 reward for the information leading to the arrest of his son. He donated it all to the Trinity Lutheran Church in Linwood, which is one of the places that his boy had burned down. So there were two of the creepiest and disturbing stories around. The world can be a crazy place and Twisted News is sure to show you why. If you like this video, then please subscribe because every week we're putting out new mysterious videos for you to check out. And make sure to listen to the Scary Mysteries in Every Town podcast as well for more chilling stories. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.